Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm still holding a position at the University of Amsterdam as a professor of uh, the history of the Jewish, Jewish cultural heritage, and in particular of the Jewish book, alongside, alongside my main uh, daily profession as a, as a general director of the Jewish culture quarter in Amsterdam. Um, my main interest today will really be the history of the Jewish book. I could be unmuted again. I unmuted myself, so I uh, have the screen here in front of me. The um, I will speak to you about. We spoke about the book tour. We can speak about the book art of Sephardic Jews. It doesn't matter. I will speak to you about the about the nature of the uh, of the book. And this is a full screen version, right? Yes. Yes. Um, but before we, so I started with the with the book art of Sephardic Jewry. Of course, that is the book art of, of Sephardic Jews of Amsterdam. But of course, one cannot disconnect the history of the book of the Sephardic world from the history of the book uh, in the, in, let's say, pre-expulsion Sephardic world. I mean, and as you will see later on in my uh, talk, there is a strong interconnection. And the Jews of Amsterdam were actually especially in their book production and in the type of Hebrew script that they chose and in the way they approached their book production were, were both, I would put it this way, Spaniards and Sephardim, which I don't take uh, to be synonyms. And uh, it's very important to keep both aspects uh, of that in mind. And in order to give you a sense of both, this is where they came from. They came from medieval Spain and where this, for example, a Flersheim Haggadah, it's called Flersheim uh, because it is part of the Flersheim collection, which is in Zurich. It's the, uh, the Flersheim collection in Zurich. We showed this book in Amsterdam many, many years ago, 1990, in, a, in an exhibition in the uh, Jewish Museum in Amsterdam. And this is a manuscript of the Haggadah. Of course, we this today or yesterday, formally, we entered the month of Nisan, so we're very close to uh, very close to Pesach. And um, this is a Haggadah that has the typical, I would say, el elongated uh, Hebrew letter uh, that is used for monumental books uh, in the Sephardic world of the Middle Ages. So the, this is a, a clearly recognizable Sephardic letter, but it's slightly longer. And this is a way of, uh, of I would say, underlining, underscoring the monumental nature of the book and this is a book, of course, that on the one hand is attractive because of its wonderful uh, calligraphy, but on the other hand, it's also attractive because it's of its unbelievable pen work. So the quality of the red rubrication, as it's called, from the Latin word from red, for red, the red rubrication, the decoration of the initial words in the Hebrew manuscripts that we find found around, find around this, uh, the opening words here in this Haggadah um, is, smashing and this kind of pen work is typically found in manuscripts from medieval Sparad and in manuscripts from medieval Italy and we have a number of scribes who were very very accomplished in this and this I show you this manuscript also for its lack of decoration which is not necessarily typical the most important manuscript that probably all of you know of of that medieval Spain is called is the Sarajevo Haggadah the Sarajevo Haggadah is an example um, of a Haggadah of the type that has a full cycle of biblical illustrations regarding for, for the for the Torah at least preceding actually the actual text of the Haggadah. So this is the Haggadah not with illustrations inside, only decorative elements inside, but rather with a full set of uh, illustrations, cy cycle of illustrations inside. The Sarajevo Haggadah is called Sarajevo after the place where it's kept. It's kept in Sarajevo, but it is a Spanish Haggadah of the of around 1300 we have two separate images here the the uh, an image of the mishkan and an image of matan torah so an interesting uh, uh two two different images they're not on not opposing page if you can see that there's a white space in the middle i showed this to you because this also goes to show that the sephardic approach to bookmaking could also be very figurative as in so many other places in jewish history jewish the way that jews have dealt with um decoration 
and with illustration in their manuscript varied enormously according to the places where they lived. But Sfarad was certainly a place where uh, illustration was allowed and where illustration texts were allowed. This is another Haggadah, very famous Haggadah, Barcelona Haggadah. It's not, it's most likely not copied and decorated in Barcelona, but it's Catalonian for sure. This is along with the text Matzah. So all this has a lot of different elements. We don't know exactly what we're looking at. We have a, a number of, of musicians at the bottom playing a fiddle, one playing a mandolin, one playing a bagpipes. Um, and this is only to underscore the festive nature uh, of the Haggadah. We can see a man wearing a kittel, uh, sagan is in, in Yiddish, but the, the kittel, the white festive gown and holding two matzot and the matzazot text, which is typical, of course, within a panel illustrated as a full opening word rather than as, a, uh, as an uh, initial word that we would uh, typically find in Latin manuscripts of the period. But the remainder of the image seems to be is decorative. We have four angels. We have four horns. They don't look like ram's horns. They may be, but they may be not. And what are they blowing at? Is that a, a, a representation of a seder plate? Is it something else? We see coats of arms, four white ones, or blank ones, and four with the stripes of that we that the soccer lovers among us will recognize the football lovers will recognize as the shirt of Barcelona, which is actually one of the reasons why it was connected to the city of Barcelona, not the soccer match, but the blue and the blue and red uh, imagery. But the truth is that we don't know exactly what we're looking at. And the remainder is, is decoration. So we have a, a very strange page here, which I just love to show. And this is one that is equally strange, Marozé from their so-called Rylands Haggadah. The Barcelona Haggadah was kept in, uh, is kept in the uh, British Library in, in London. The Rylands Haggadah is kept in the John Rylands University Library in, uh, or the, today they call it the John Rylands Library in uh, Manchester. And it's another Spanish Haggadah. Here we have an image of Maror. We have two figures around Maror at the, at the top which are also clearly decorative. They're Gothic, like, like Gothic representations, fantasy representations that we find in so many uh, examples of medieval art, including from Spain. It's not Jewish. I mean, this is, this is just the taste of the period and the taste of the place and time where the Jews were active, the Portuguese Jews were active. But we also have a scene at the bottom in which we see a wedded couple sitting at the Seder table. The woman is raising the glass and the men in a misog mis misogynist gesture, which is a misogynist gesture, is not my interpretation. We know it from a couple of other pieces, uh, illustrating the words Marose points at his wife. This, these bitter herbs, and the bitter herbs that he's referring to is the wife. And the uh, so that is something that we. Uh, that we see quite often in uh, in medieval manuscripts and into the 20th century, actually, not, not so it's, uh, we, we, we know of this custom. Um, and for those of you who are into cooking, of course, in Western Europe, we have, uh, we have chosen the bitter herbs to be sharp, uh, rather horseradish, rather than bitter. An artichoke is bitter. So this is a medieval representation of an artichoke as a representation of the bitter, of the bitter herb. Why do I show you this? So many people actually, after seeing this image, after I showed them this image, decided that they would use artichoke rather than horseradish because the artichoke can actually be a pleasure to eat rather than horseradish, which is only sharp, although many people seem to like it. This is where the uh, Sephardic Jews came from. And this is their, uh, their, their book culture. And of course, it's not all of it is as rich as the Haggadot that I'm here showing. A lot of it is just plain uh, transmission of text to Hebrew manuscripts. But this is where the Sephardim came from before they were expelled from Spain. And there are so many manuscripts that, that also tell you something uh, about the highbrow culture. There's a manuscript in the Braginsky collection which actually enters my mind as we speak, which I did not put into the, uh, into the PowerPoint presentation. I could have, I probably should have. If you go online to Braginsky with a Y collection.com, Braginsky collection, I'll put it in the chat afterwards, or one of you can perhaps put it in the chat, www.braginskycollection.com. 
uh, you will find the manuscript in two, two volumes, one volume with a colophon toward the end, 1491, Ocania, Spain, and one half of the Hebrew Bible with a colophon at the very end, it copied in 1494, three years after the expulsion, in, in Evora. So the Jews took with them, the, the Spanish Jews and the, the, the Iberian Jews took with them a book culture that was rich, a book culture that they adhere to, and a book culture that is still present in the thinking and in the minds of the uh, Sparadim of Amsterdam in the 17th and 18th century, which of course is more than a century after the expulsion. That is something that we tend to forget, but there is this, what happened also in terms of book culture in the 16th century, during this period between the expulsion itself and the uh, first settlement of the Jews in Amsterdam, what happened in between there, especially in terms of book production is, is relatively unclear, certainly when it comes to writing Hebrew books. Of course, we have entered at the end of the, four, at the, end of the, uh, the, the, the 15th century, we have already entered the age of printing. My typical division for, I'd say in Sephardic history, the main divide, the main division is the division between the pre-expulsion and post-expulsion. The expulsion from Spain and Portugal is the decisive moment in Sephardic history. Um, it's at the end of the Middle Ages, or is it already at the beginning of the early modern period? That's unimportant, but I, I, I claim that the, the, that the division into medieval and post-medieval is relatively irrelevant for the Jewish world and certainly in the history of the Jewish book. What is really of importance in the history of the Jewish book is the time before the invention of printing and the time after the invention of printing. Hebrew printing started in Italy, 1469, 1472, where the first Hebrew books were printed in Italy. There were Hebrew books printed in Portugal, in Spain, and one book in Constantinople. And the big invention of the, and the big difference between before the, the invention of printing and after the invention of printing is the fact that the makers of books had a choice. They could choose between writing a book by hand, copying a book by hand, or uh, distributing it in an hundreds of copies at once. And it's the, the uh, American scholar David Ruderman, uh, who in his book on the early, early modern period, on early modern jury, recent book on early modern jury, had a full chapter on the invention of printing, which he called the explosion of knowledge. What happened with the distribution of books in printing is a serious explosion of knowledge. And it's not, not so different from the explosion of knowledge that we are experiencing right now. With the internet, with the availability of sources, with the overall availability, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, if we couldn't find the name of a singer, we would have to go to either an encyclopedia uh, or ask a friend, or drive ourselves, drive ourselves crazy. Now you look it up. Um, the, so the, this is a serious explosion of knowledge. This was also true of the, six, of the 15th century, there was, and especially the 16th century. This enormous explosion of availability of written text has made an enormous impact on Judaism. And although there were only 150 tops Hebrew books printed in the 15th century, and a few thousand in the 16th century, the multiplication of the printing process, which is anything between, let's say, 300 and maybe 2,000, 3,000 copies, is enormous. And this has also had a big impact on the, uh, on the um, Sephardic world, just as well. On the Sephardic world, on the Sephardic diaspora, on, it, on Italy, and later on also in the Netherlands. But it is important to keep in mind that handwritten books were continued to be produced. So it's not that the Jews stopped producing books by hand. On the contrary, the appreciation of a handwritten work was something that is that is very typical of the Jewish tradition, in which we should not forget a handwritten Torah scroll is the center of, of the religious practice. It's the cent it's also the 
prime element of religious veneration. We don't venerate a book, we venerate a scroll. So it's, it's important to keep that in mind. So the appreciation of handwriting um, led to a continuation of the production of Hebrew handwritten books after the invention of printing, but probably shouldn't be overdoing it. I mean, with the number of, of or, or over stating it with the number or, of, of Hebrew books printed, Jewish books printed, growing, of course, printed books became more and more dominant. And it led to a lot of things. It led, to, first of all, it led to the stabilization of the transmission of text. You have to realize that a, a, an important text like the Zohar, which is the, the, the number one text, the, the, the core text of, of, of Kabbalah, Zohar hardly existed uh, before its first printed edition in the 1560s, where the two there were actually two printed editions in the 1560s. There was no Zohar. It was only after the there were there was what scholars have called a Zoharic corpus of, of knowledge, but there was no Zohar. So the printing not only led to the availability of knowledge, but it also led to the stabilization, stabilization of knowledge. And that is a very important thing to keep in mind. And uh, again, certain, especially Kabbalah is an interesting example, Jewish mysticism. This was something was not meant for everybody. So oftentimes it was decided that these books would not be printed, that really that, that mystical works would not be printed and would rather continue, would be continue to be distributed manually or in handwritten copies in a limited number of copies. But of course, Especially the Bible, and this is a, this is the famous Biblia en lengua española, the Ferrara Bible, uh, which actually the Jewish Historical Museum keeps the only copy uh, in Amsterdam. This is the famous Ferrara Bible. This was the number one Spanish Bible uh, of the Sephardic diaspora, printed in Ferrara in 1553. A very important landmark. And if you look at the at the uh, illustration. The decorative elements on the title page of the Ferrara Bible, you can clearly see that the Jews did not produce their books in isolation. I mean, there's nothing Jewish about what you're looking at here, <laughs> other than we know that this is the traditional word-for-word uh, -word translation of the true Hebrew text, as we can read on the title page, um, of the uh, Old Testament, of the text of the Old Testament. So, and it was printed with the privilege, with the, with the uh, I would say, the written permission and the blessing uh, of the Duke of Ferrara, as you can see at the bottom of the page. Con privilegio illustrissimo senior Duque de Ferrara. So it's an important um, landmark in the printing. And beware, it's not in Hebrew, it's in Spanish. Spanish as the language is in Latin script. And it's not in, in Ladino, uh, which would be written in Hebrew. It's in Spanish script, and it's a Spanish translation. Um, Latin, Latin script, a Spanish translation, which is, of course, typical of the tradition of the Western Sephardi. The Western Sephardi used the Spanish and printed the Spanish. And a lot of the printing, uh, especially in the early days of the uh, Sephardic diaspora, of the West, the Western Sephardic diaspora, as Joseph, Joseph Kaplan used, 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 to, used to call it, call it it's, it's used to call it, uh, it's in Spanish, in Latin letters. And that is what we find here. And it is obvious that the printers of such work would, uh, works would work together with their non-Jewish colleagues working in the same city and producing text in Latin characters. Why would they, why would they not? Uh, so this is what was going on in Ferrara. 1553, of course, is a difficult date uh, is that in the 1550 in uh, Italy were actually the time in which the Inquisition uh, arranged for a number of huge burnings of the Talmud uh, in, uh, in, in Italy, in Venice, in the Plaza uh, in, Fiori, in, on Plaza San Marco, in Venice, in Plaza San Marco, in Rome, uh, in Bologna, so the fact that such a book with a Jewish background would be printed, uh, especially in, in, in this particular time, 
in the history of, let's say, Jewish-Italian relationships and Jewish-Catholic relationships is an interesting thing in itself. But that goes beyond the uh, scope of this. But this, so this is in, in Spanish. And at the same time, this is probably the first Spanish publication with a Jewish background in the Netherlands. Uh, my predecessor in the Rosenthaliana, I've worked in the Biblioteca Rosenthaliana in Amsterdam for many years. My, my predecessor in the Rosenthaliana, Adrie Offenberg and Harm den Boer in Basel, uh, were actually the one to establish that this book, which doesn't have a, uh, an address or doesn't have an imprint, uh, was printed in Dordrecht, most likely in 1584. And it's the it's the daily uh, order of the Shona, so it's a Sidur. And it has the order for Hanukkah, for Purim, for Pesach, for Shavuot, Sukkot. And uh, it's it's a prayer book. So it's clearly a prayer book for the Jews who then resided in the southern Netherlands, because we're not aware of Sephardic Jews uh, already living in Amsterdam as early as 1584. So this is for the Western Sephardic diaspora before they made their way to Amsterdam. So this is an interesting publication, very early, again, not in Hebrew, in Spanish. This is Sidur, 1512. Of course, we're now 15 years or 20 years, I would say 15, 16, 17 years after the first settling of Sephardic Jews in Amsterdam. And we have here the third part of the Sidur. There's a primera part of the Sidur, segunda, tercera. As far as I know, there's only one or two copies known of each. And this is a copy in Rosenthaliana. Um, and this is the third part, the third part of the daily prayer book with the prayers for Rosh Hashanah, Kippur, and a couple in the Slichot and, and a couple of others, a couple of other festivals. So this is a small prayer book. One of the major disadvantages, I would say, of the uh, presentation of books online is that with all the detail that I can show to you, there's one aspect, or basically there are two aspects actually. First of all, you will never experience what what Walter Benjamin has called the aura of the original. The aura of the original is gone. I mean, it's a flat surface, and you will never understand. You will never experience. You will understand, but you will never experience what it means to have the historical sensation of holding a book that has been used within the community for so long. And the other thing, the other aspect that you don't see here is size. This is a very small book. Every book that I show to you online seems uh, equally big. They're not. Some of them are miniature, some of them are enormous. So that is something that you have to keep in mind as well, that the aspect of size you will never be able to understand. This is something that was actually printed in Frankfurt. It, is, it says, on the title page, but it has what we call in, in bibliography a false address, a false imprint. It is, show, it is proven on the basis of the, uh, of the letters used, of the paper used of, used, of a couple of other things, by, it was printed by printers in Amsterdam. It was not printed in Frankfurt. Why? It's interesting. I mean, there was, of course, freedom of the printing press in Amsterdam, but the Jews were oftentimes aware of a certain tension with the local authorities. And we don't understand that because they already printed a lot of Spanish in, in those days. So we never entirely un are understood in detail why they would choose to do this, uh, to rather to print Frankfurt, although it was printed in Amsterdam. But this is something that happens more often. Oftentimes the political considerations, sometimes it has to do with the finances of an edition not wanting, not wanting uh, to be known, the many different reasons why people would decide to print a book in Amsterdam, but to say that it is printed in Frankfurt. Uh, but it also goes to show that the Jews, on the one hand, felt free to express themselves in Amsterdam, but were still very much aware also of their status as a minority within that Amsterdam. Uh, society of the 17th century. There were, they had only just, this is the first generation, they had only just uh, finished, I would say, their negotiations with the uh, municipality of Amsterdam about their settling rights. Amst the city of Amsterdam has actually never formally confirmed that. 
So the the uh, other than cities like Haarlem and, and Rotterdam and the Alkmaar, um, so there was always tension and there was always it was you had to be careful. I return to that later on, uh, but this was printed in 1625. This is another example by Abraham, Abraham Farrar, a book on the 613 commandments of the Holy Law with floral decoration on the title page, a nice little vignette uh, on the title page. Um, again, the book in Spanish, a nice little uh, uh, vignette on the title page, which is clearly decorative, um, which is a reflection of a taste uh, an artistic taste that is reminiscent of the artistic uh, taste in Spain. I, I call them Spaniards deliberately. I call them Sfaradim and I call them Spaniards. And the, the, there is a, a prominence of floral decoration uh, in a lot of Spanish bookmaking. And the floral decoration one finds back in the bookmaking of the Amsterdam Sephardim of the 17th and 18th century. And it's something to look for. Even if you go to Bet Chaim, if you go to the, to the cemetery in Oudekerk and Amstel, Look for the floral decorations, it will be full of it. And there's a clear connection between the floral decoration of a lot of these books, a floral decoration of a lot of the manuscript, the floral decoration of Kutubot, the floral decoration of Megilot, and the floral decoration that you will find in Spanish art of this period. Um, this is, of course, a very famous uh, map by, by Jacob Judah Leon Templo, the famous Amsterdam uh, scholar rabbi who. Uh, made the model of the temple in Jerusalem, whose model of the temple in Jerusalem was a source of inspiration uh, for Elias Bauman, the non-Jewish uh, architect of the Esnocha in Amsterdam. And this is a, a beautiful hand-colored uh, map of the uh, tabernacle of the Temple of Solomon, and it has a beautiful portrait by uh, of uh, Jacob Judelon, whom, whom we see in a lot more detail here. Of course, this is not bookmaking, but uh, Jacob Dürer Leon was also known for his many books. He published books in Dutch, in, in Spanish, in German, in English, in Latin on the temple. He had a wooden model of the temple, which uh, my predecessor in the Jewish Museum, uh, Joel Kahan, Joel Kahan typically called the first Jewish museum in Amsterdam. Uh, and it probably was. It was a place that people went to. He had a wooden model of the temple in Jerusalem. And this is the man, this is the man. So he made his books, but he was also someone who was interested in showing his knowledge, showing his scholarship to the world. And a lot of non-Jewish travelers in the 17th century will actually refer to having visited Jacob Judah Leon's model of the temple. And they knew it through his books. They knew it through his, through his book that reached a variety of audiences not only his Jewish peers, not only his Sephardic peers, but also through all the translations in so many languages, his scholarly non-Jewish peers, other travelers, people were just aware of the fact that this was a number one attraction in Amsterdam. And it was also scholarly work. And it was also great art, great artistic work. And if you look at the quality, so this is a printed image colored by hand a uh, broadside color by hand. And the quality of the hand coloring uh, actually points towards, I would say, a, a cooperation between Jews and non-Jews again, because this, this uh, technique of hand coloring was, was very typical of Amsterdam uh, in the 17th century. The hand coloring was especially popular with maps. A map, a hand colored map, was the best thing after a real painting. So if you couldn't afford a real painting, you would afford a printed image, which you would then have set off by hand, colored by hand, by an artist who was great at doing this. And this is such an example. So this is a map that would typically have hung on a wall. We only know of a second example in an atlas that is kept in Vienna. This one is kept in the Rosenthaliana. And it's just very nice to look at. It's, it's also, if you look at the left, you can see that this is also very much a natural, a representation of things that go on in nature. Um, but it's just a fun a piece of work and it gives you a sense of what is going on here on the thing. So this is Jacob de Leon and he produced books. He produced books on the uh, construction of the temple and here at the bottom, if you can see my cursor here at the bottom, you can actually see how he uh, 
has his model of the temple. And if you look at the, the supports here, the, call, the supporting elements, architectural elements here, and you will remember the building of the Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam on the side, you will remember that these are exactly these supporting elements, which were inspired by this particular model of the temple of Jacob de Leon. So the, these books were uh, digested by a variety of audiences, and it, it would be a mistake to assume that these were only pointed towards the local community, that these were only directed towards the, uh, the, the, the Western Sephardic diaspora, that these were only directed toward the Jewish world, but they were part of the world in which the Sephardim, the multilingual, multicultural world that the Sephardic Jews of Amsterdam lived in. I think that is very important to underscore. This is another prayer book, 1663, Ordon de Rosa Sanai Kippur. It also goes to show, of course, that prayers were apparently um, still, still said in Spanish, because why else would you, uh, or were at least read in Spanish during the synagogue services? Because why else would we have so many printed editions of, uh, of, of, of the prayer book into Spanish? which of course, of course goes a long way to explain the extent uh, to which the community, I wouldn't say the elite, I'm sure not the elite, but the community as such was capable of understanding the Hebrew. This is the pro, this is the, these are the first two or three generations in which the Sephardic elites were uh, molding the Sephardic identity is the Jews of Amsterdam, and it's reflected in the languages. We actually also have, and I don't show it here, but we have a, a uh, group of some 15, maybe 10 to 15 uh, manuscripts of translations of the Sephardic prayer book into Dutch. What does it, in, of the 17th century and the early 18th century, what does it show to us? We're not sure what it, what it, what it does. I mean, when we find the first one, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Abri Oppenberg, my predecessor in the Rosenthaliana, uh, recently passed away. He, he assumed that this was maybe a book that was produced uh, to show the content or to have a check on the content of the prayers for the Dutch authorities. Uh, so Hebrew prayers would be said, this prayers would be said in Hebrew. And then you would have a Dutch translation by which they could check. But if you have 15 or 20 of those, that doesn't make sense. And we also, we are, we've reached a point where we have, there are books in the Rosenthaliana, there are a couple in Esrim, there is, there is a bunch in Columbia University. And it so happens that the curator of Columbia University is in our audience of the Hebrew Jewish holdings of Columbia University. There are a couple of others in JTS library uh, there's some in Hamburg, so we know of, of a lot of Dutch, and then I've also seen them on the market. So there are a couple of Dutch translations. like, well, why were they made? We don't know. Um, what does it tell us about, the, about the, the, the praying practice? We can assume that the, that, that the Sephardic Jews never prayed in Dutch, but why would they then have a full translation of the prayer book? So the multilingual aspect of the Dutch Jewish community, the, the Sephardic Jewish community of Amsterdam uh, in the 17th and early 18th century, this basically disappears in the course of the 18th century. But the, this first 150 years of presence in Amsterdam or 130 years of presence, what, what languages were used under which circumstances by whom? Those are questions that are still very, very difficult to answer. I certainly don't have definitive answers to them, if only for the fact that the book, that the, 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 the survival uh, of books that will help us to understand that doesn't answer these these questions easily. So this is really a point of further research, and I'm also happy that Heide Wanke, who spoke to you already uh, a few a few meetings ago on the SVM Library, will actually write a dissertation on, among others, on this topic on what what how how should we understand the production of books? Who were the audiences? To which to which needs were these? people who were producing this book catering. Well, he was certainly not catering to the needs of the Sephardic community anymore. These are the, this is the first uh, post posthumous edition in Dutch of uh, the works by Baruch de Spinoza, BDS, 
It's not today's BDS, it's another BDS. It's a far better one in spite of everything. Uh, so this is Baruch de Spinoza. Uh, of course, with only with his initials, uh, again, for obvious uh, political reasons, it was published posthumously after his death in 1676. And another book in 1679, Excellencia Astanoz Hebreos, Yitzhak Cardozo, one of the famous books that celebrates the excellence of the Jews as compared to the other nations of the world, a part of a large group of books that were largely copied manually. They were not copied, they were not printed, they were not distributed in printing, books that were meant by the Sephardic rabbinical elites to provide information uh, on a very high intellectual theological level of the uh, the prominence and the 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 uh, how do you put that on the, the the prominence of the Jewish faith as compared to the non-Jewish faith, which is typically understood and explained these polemical works as works that were meant to draw in the people who had had gone over to Catholicism and had to draw them back into Judaism. The truth is, if you try to read them, and I deliberately use. This, this conditional phrase, if you try to read them, they're very difficult. So I'm, I wonder, I've always wondered whether this was really meant for the masses, whether this was not a, a, a theological elite, elitist debate on the prominence of the Jewish faith as compared to the other religions and not hated or not, not projected towards the masses because the masses could not understand it. I can't imagine and, and they should certainly, they would probably not be interested in it either. So to, again, who were the audiences? This is a very difficult question. And why was it decided where, where so many of such books were distributed in small copy, in small, in, in, in one copy handwritten or two or 10 or 12 or 15 copies handwritten? Why was it decided to print this one in a run of, I would say at least 300 to 500? Um, who are the audiences? That is a very difficult question to answer, and we don't have that. We don't have these answers available as yet. Um, it's a very important work, the Triumphal del Coviano, Coviano Popular, very, very rare book. I've only seen, I think, three or four copies. I think, uh, and Bill Peters, the former, for those of you who have been working in this field for many years, uh, Bill Peters, the former. Uh, archivist of the city of Amsterdam in the 1970s and maybe even in the 1980s has written her dissertation on Daniel Levy de Barrios and has done an inventory of editions of the Triumpo de Coviano Popular. It's, a, it's a, a grouping of a variety of works on basically of, of, of Jewish literature. Um, clearly for the community, if you look at the names mentioned in cursive script, uh, Isaac Balmonte, Jacob de Pinto, Jacob Abadano de Brito, all, all famous names from the community. Um, Mordechai Franco Mendes, Joseph Mokata, these are all members, members of this community. And they were clearly interested also in Spanish literature. Uh, so it's a, it's an interest, and, and so this is an literary works in Spanish. So again, this is this multilingual aspect. And the decoration, as you can see here, was simply taken, this is a printed book, was simply taken uh, from a book that was printed in Amsterdam by a non-Jewish printer, Jacob de Jonge, uh, on a to totally different topic. So this also goes to show a, a strong uh, technical cooperation between the basically two Amsterdam printers borrowing their illustrative, illustrative, uh, illustrating devices from each other, probably from the neighbor. And you should, we should realize that, that the uh, we tend to think of Amsterdam as a city of as a maritime city of the 17th century, but Amsterdam, more than anything else, was the number one book city of the 17th and early 18th century. There was not a the so the the, the book and there's a, a colleague of mine at the University of Amsterdam who's tried to capitalize, tried to come up with numbers. And one might assume that the economic uh, profit of the book industry in Amsterdam, not only Jewish, but of the book production in Amsterdam was actually bigger than that of international export. 
and import. So the international road, so it's of, of um, and the maritime export. But there was an enormous market for this. Amsterdam was really, really a 17th century center of book production. And the Jews were a small, albeit uh, active part of that tradition. It was not an isolated effort of the Jews of Amsterdam to produce their books. It was in the in the in the early period, the 15th century, maybe even the early 16th century, these were really pioneers. But the Portuguese Jews who came to Amsterdam, the Sephardic Jews who came to Amsterdam in the 17th century entered a city in which printing was already present uh, on a very, very high technical level. And they were part of that. They were an integral part of that tradition and tradition, and they communicated with their colleagues. Here again, but that little piece in Hebrew that we have up here is part of the illustration. It was not printed, it was printed and as, as a single libros de la Ley Divino. So this is just one plate, but it's a printed book printed by David de Castro Tartas in Amsterdam in 54, 51, which is 1691. Uh, it's a Spanish translation of the Torah. The Cinco, so it, and this is even later, very, very strange text, the Dialogo de Montes, a, uh, an auto, as it's called, which is a stage play, which was actually performed in uh, the synagogue in Amsterdam in, uh, in, in 5384, which is 1624, a stage play which is basically modeled after a one act play in auto, as they say in Spanish, a one act play that was very popular in the Spanish world. There is a manuscript of this text, Bayro El Yeserun, in Esraim, but this is a later printed version of that same text, printed as late as 1766, text 1767, 5527. And it is a stage play which was actually once performed, but it was later decided it was no longer allowed in the synagogue um, to between seven mountains in the Holy Land, discussing which mountain would be fit, would be the best mountain for Moses to receive the tablets of the law. It's quite a thing. Imagine that being performed in the synagogue. So the text remained popular as a, uh, as a, as a, as a, literary text, but it was never performed after this one time in 1624, which was, of course, not in Esnoja, because Esnoja was consecrated 1675, but within the community. We then go back 50 years, or, or a century, basically. We go back a century. We get to the first Hebrew printed in Amsterdam by a Jew, and of course, that is Manasseh in Israel. It was not the first Hebrew printed in Amsterdam. So there had been experiments with Hebrew printing um, by a Huguenot, uh, no, by a, by, a, by a British minister, uh, Hugh Broughton, uh, who had experimented with strange, difficult texts in Arab Aramaic and, and, and Hebrew. Um, and, uh, but this is, Manasseh ben Israel was the first Jew. And what you see here on the right, you see his portrait, this is the portrait that we believe, that we know is him done by Salomitalia, as you can see at the bottom, it is the name of Salomitalia. And this is the title page of the first book. There are only three copies known of this first book printed by Manasseh ben Israel. This is a, an image of a copy kept in the Bodleian Library. There's one in the college library, in, also in Oxford. And the third one was part of the uh, a collection of the Valmadonna Trust Library. The Valmadonna Trust Library was a li private library kept in London. It was promised to Adrie Offenberg and myself by the late owner of the Valmadonna Trust Library numerous times. He never delivered. It, would, it became part of the uh, sale of that collection, which was actually a tripartite sale, I would say, a major part of the collection, the majority of important pieces. Who saw the bees in New York, and the remainder to a private collector in Switzerland, not the one that I'm connected with, and uh, the National Library of Israel. And the truth is, I don't know whether this copy 
of this one of one of these three copies of Menashe Ben Israel's first printed book made it to the National Library or to the collector. I'm not sure. Um, it has a preface, and this to get back to my point of size, this is a miniature booklet. If you can, well, you can imagine how big my face must be. It's it's one third of my face in length. So it's uh, it's really a small booklet, a miniature booklet, which you keep in your, keep in your pocket. And it's a regular prayer book, Sadat Filot. And it was financed by Ephraim Bueno, Abraham Safati, but Amstel Rodama. This is the old spelling of the city of Amsterdam, Amstel Rodama. So it was printed in, and this is where Amsterdam takes its name from, of course, from the river Amstel. So Amstel Rodama is one of the old spellings. Um, in the printing house of Manasseh ben Israel, in the year 1627, and the date that is mentioned elsewhere uh, refers to the 1st of January 1627. This is the beginning of Jewish printing in Hebrew in Amsterdam, 1st of January 1627, and it's the beginning of everything. Of course, he needed letters. So we have a, uh, a preface by Yitzhak Abob da Fonseca, the famous rabbi whose name is, is, is also appearing in the above the entrance of Esnocha. If you go into the entrance of Esnocha, of Esnocha you can you can read as part of the of the of the year that is hidden in the text above the above the door. You can read the name of Abu Abba Fonseca, the famous rabbi, the, the rabbi who went to Brazil when when the Jewish when when the Dutch went to Brazil in the 1630s and 40s. Manasseh ben Israel didn't go. Isaac Abu Abba Fonseca went. Manasseh always was blamed him for his entire life for that. And he wrote the preface. He says Manasseh ben Yosef ben Israel. Seeing the Bomberg types, and Bomberg was a, uh, a Flemish printer who worked in Venice, who produced all famous Hebrew books of the 16th century, Manasseh ben Yosef ben Israel, seeing that the Hebrew types, the Hebrew letters of Bomberg had worn out, and since nothing can be imperfect for the holy work, arose from within the community and went out and came to the house of an artisan. And behold, he was standing there at his work, the tools of his trade in his hand, and he said to him, Behold, the money is given to you in the shapes of the letters to make as is good in the eyes, honorable and respected, Michael Yuda, first among the scribe. The man swore in real writing to make them for him and for no other man. He shaped them and made them too good to look at and fine to read, as perfect as cast in gold. And there were two men, Bueno and Safati, who I may refer to before, who were most, most amazed to see the completeness of the work and its beauty and it lifted up their hearts to bring to the work of printing a little Sidur, the likes of which had never been seen since there were printers on the earth. But this is the, but what's that, what does this explain to us? It explains to us that Manasseh ben Israel had new letters made, Hebrew letters made to print in Hebrew. It explains to us that he had seen that the Hebrew letters that had been used before in the world of Hebrew printing, those of Bomberg, were no longer usable. These letters returned to Antwerp were also available in Leiden. He decided no longer to use them. And he had new letters made. And he went to the local sofer, the local scribe of the community, Michael Yehuda, and had them approved by him. So he wanted the letters to be okay by the local scribe of the community, the Shafan scribe. And I, I stress this because it's important for our understanding of identity, the role of identity. So he wanted the letters to be Sephardic letters that had to be approved of by the uh, Sephardic scribe of the community. So his letters could not just be Hebrew letters, but they had to be Sephardic letters approved of by the scribe. And these were his letters. They were not very different. And, and you, you really have to, they look very much like the earlier uh, Hebrew letters that were used in the 17th century, but Amsterdam letters would become the number one trademark for quality. And they were Sephardic. These were Sephardic letters. He used them in one of his best works, his be most beautiful work, Sefer Elim of 1629. Beautiful Hebrew printing, very complicated. This is among his first printed books. He was an accomplished printer from the very start. For a big audience of printers and and uh, Joseph Salomon or Del Medico, whom I mentioned here, uh, came to Amsterdam to have this book printed in Amsterdam by Menasseh Ben Israel. 
especially for that reason, because of the repute of Manasseh ben Israel. We have a catalog of his book list here. We can go on. This is Manasseh ben Israel, the famous etching by Rembrandt of 1636, which uh, we now believe is not Manasseh. So I showed you the image before this one of Salom Italia. This is the Rembrandt issue. This is another man. I mean, the, and the identification of this person from the Rembrandt etching as Manasseh ben Israel uh, is an identification that is as late as the 17, late 1740s. So that is almost a century after the death of Manasseh ben Israel that this etching was for the first time identified as representing Manasseh. Whereas this image of Salom Italia, done by Salom Italia, that I showed you before, is according to life. So this is, and Daniel Fitzinski, uh, the famous historian of the Sephardic history, actually once claimed that he liked the idea that this should be Manasseh ben Israel because he thinks of Manasseh ben Israel as a, a person with a certain suave, and he likes the idea that this is Manasseh ben Israel much more than the serious rabbi that we see on this image. But the truth is that this is most likely not him, and this is him, and this is me, a young version of myself at his grave, uh, which was actually restored, uh, this is at least 15 years ago, this is actually restored uh, by the Jews of England, 1657, uh, Manasseh ben Israel died, 1957, this grave was restored by the Jews of England, because as you will know, Manasseh ben Israel was not only a printer, he was not only a rabbi, but he was also a diplomat, to quote uh, famously Cecil Roth, uh, and he was the one who was instrumental in the readmission of the Jews to England in the 1650s after the Whitehall Conference, in which he made a plea to Oliver Cromwell to readmit the Jews to England after they had been expelled from England in 1290. So this is what you look at here. And Manasseh ben Israel is an interesting figure. He, this is a, I mean, this is this is technical, but this is a communication circuit. It is Robert Danton in 1981, famously. Uh, famously defined all the different stages of book publishing. He says there was an author, author goes to the publisher, they go to the printers, they, they go to suppliers, the printers go to shippers, agents, smugglers, they go to booksellers, the booksellers go to readers and binders, and then it goes back to the author. This is, a, and intellectual influences influence bookmaking, economic influences influence bookmaking, political influences influence bookmaking. What is interesting about Benazza Ben Israel Whereas this is defined by a non-Jewish or by a student of non-Jewish books as separate roles, Manasseh ben Israel was everything. He was an author, he was a publisher, he was a printer, he was a shipper, he was a bookseller, and he was a reader. So Manasseh ben Israel played all these roles at once. So this is typical of this period. This is just a couple of other important manuscripts that were done after him because Manasseh was really the beginning of what then would be an explosion again of book production, printed book production in Amsterdam in the uh, in the 17th century. And Amsterdam became the number one center of Hebrew book production in Europe. And the letters of Amsterdam, and as we have it here printed here in Amsterdam, the letters of Amsterdam were considered of the highest quality. The paper of Amsterdam was considered of the, high, the highest quality paper. And just it was just a quality stamp, a kashrut certificate for a book to be printed in Amsterdam, in the city of Amsterdam. And this, of course, is a famous little booklet in the year Moshea um, and in the year 1666, which shows chapter three, the false Messiah sitting on his throne, wearing the Ateret Svi, the crown of Svi, uh, in a little tikkun, a mystically inspired prayer book that celebrates uh, uh, chapter Svi, who, of course, was turned out not to be the Messiah shortly afterwards. We have connections again with the Christian world. Johannes Leusten was involved by Jewish printers, a, a, a Hebrewist of, of Utrecht was involved by Jewish printers to be the corrector and the editor of a Hebrew Bible. So again, the, this was not an isol isolated effort. This was an effort of the Jews living in the Christian world reaching out to a variety of audience, including Christian audiences. And the book uh, on the left, we have this 
Hebrew Bible by Joseph Atias, as we can see here, printed in Amsterdam. It's a Hebrew Bible. It only has a Latin title page. And here we have a Staten Bible, a Bible from issued by the States General of the Netherlands, uh, first edition 1637, and this is one of the later editions. And you can see how the Jews imprinting their Hebrew Bibles for a partly Jewish, partly non-Jewish audience would make the connection with the Dutch surroundings. That, that Bible, uh, and I know that the word translation should have an S, but I can't correct it anymore. Uh, that Hebrew, uh, that Jewish Bible translation, uh, or that Hebrew Bible edition inspired Yiddish translations, but by partly by, by Amsterdam Sephardic printers. This is another aspect of Amsterdam Sephardic book production. Sephardic printers printed for the Ashkenazic market in Amsterdam. And Ashkenazic printers printed for the Sephardi market in Amsterdam. So there, there was a close interrelation between these, these Faradim and Ashkenazim. They were never only each other's neighbors. There would always have been some sort, there will always have been some sort of competition. But in book production, it was a genuine cooperation. Um, and these these printers, there were these were two two Yiddish translations that were published in 1679. There's a lot to tell there. 1727, another beautiful example here on blue paper, luxurious blue paper printed in Amsterdam, a Bible with illustrations by Picard on the title page. And at the same time, and this is probably brings me toward the end a little bit. At the same time, the there was handwritten production. This is a hand-colored uh, ketubah, ketubah from Rotterdam. There is it Amsterdam. I, I wrote Rotterdam. I have an old PowerPoint translation in which I, no, it's Amsterdam, it's not Rotterdam. Um, 1617, kept in the Israel Museum, by the way. Uh, I told you many of these texts that were about the truth of the law of Moses, as we can read here, Iverdat de la Ley de Mosé, the truth of the law of Moses books, these polemical books that were meant to show the, the, the prominence of the Jewish faith. This is in Spanish. It is copied by hand by a fantastic scribe, Yuda Maccabeu. Heide will have spoken about him as well. This is again Yuda Maccabeu and his, his, his vineyards. It is copied by hand. These are handwritten books. These are books that the Jews of Amsterdam probably didn't want the authorities to read because they were polemical works. So they distributed them in, in, in handwriting rather than in printing. There will not have been enormous audiences for them either. And this is a, a show of hands by that uh, scribe, Yehuda Maccabeu, who was in Brazil, who came back from Brazil to La Rochelle on the French Atlantic coast in 1655. And we have beautiful examples of the variety of Hebrew scripts that he could write. And he is mentioned, as has been pointed out by uh, um, Jonathan Israel, he was mentioned as a fortifier, a forger of uh, Spanish trade documents in Spanish archives. So he was, the, so the audiences were warned for him and for the qualities of calligraphy because you could order uh, forged uh, letters, forged trade letters. And so he made, he made a living by writing by copying important text, by making beautiful books, and also by forging documents. It was very interesting. Uh, there were handwritten, Megillot were produced. This is a Megilla copied by hand with a beautiful set of illustrations kept in the Briginsky collection in Zurich, of which I'm also the curator. Here's another example of a Megilla copied by hand, drawn by hand, by Salomitalia, 1641. So there's an enormous wealth of production of books, both in print and in handwriting. This is another one. This is a printed border. What you see around here is printed. The Hebrew text is handwritten. This is a printed border. This is an ivory stave, an ivory holder. And this is a silk backing of the first piece of parchment. So this scroll is made up of four pieces of parchment. And the, or maybe three, and the first piece of parchment is covered with silk. And if you find a Megillah, an old one, an old Megillah with the backing of silk of the first membrane of the first piece of parchment, it will always be Amsterdam, is my tip. There may be 5% uh, exceptions, but if you want to look smart, full, full first, first, first membrane covered with silk, Amsterdam for, for a Megillah. 
This is another Mickey Law kept in the New York Public Library. Again, the beautiful floral motifs, handwritten books with beautiful illustrated title pages, Poeta del Cielo, copied by another famous, um, uh, copied for another famous man, Ishak de Matatya Aboab. And this is his son, Matatya de Ishak Aboab. He was also a very accomplished scribe who could also write the most beautiful Hebrew scripture you can think of, including this beautiful cursive writing. And that's the last, uh, last element of, of information that I will share with you. So he wrote Hebrew, typical, regular Sephardic Hebrew, but he also wrote these beautiful semi-cursive Hebrew letters. Beautiful, they look almost look like Arabic. Very, uh, very elegant, very beautiful. And you would think, where did they come from? This is where they come from. This is a Mugin manuscript kept in the University of Library. They're pre-expulsion Sephardic letters. So the scribe deliberately copied, and these letters were very popular in manuscripts at this period. He deliberately copied, and this is another example of 1480, pre-expulsion Spanish letters of the late 15th century. And he copied them <coughs> in his 18th century manuscripts. We have them here in his 18th century manuscript, and we can compare them here. This is the two examples on, left, on the left, the two examples of his handwriting uh, by the scribe Matatya, the Ishak the Matatya Boa, um, in Amsterdam at the end of the 17th century. And this is the script of the end of the 15th century. He wanted to re-identify through his script with pre-expulsion Spain. And this is very important. So it goes to show identity politics as part of book production, uh, of book production strategies prevalent in Amsterdam in these days. And this is just as a nice, uh, a nice, Floating up uh, because I think that I'm reaching my uh, limits for the time. I'm not sure. I think I am. I finished the hour. It could go on for half an hour. But the, the, uh, this is a beautiful uh, wedding poem, kept in the Rosenthaliana, Ototahava, made for a wedding, as you can read in the Hebrew, for a, a wedding of Jacob, Yosef, Teixeira de Matos, and Sarah, Yitzchak, Levi, Jimenez members of the Amsterdam Sephardic community. It's Ototava, Signs of Love. It's a wedding poem. It's a wedding poem by a famous uh, poet, by, poet by the name of Yitzhak Shiprute Gabay. We know him for, from, from other works as well. And this is copied by hand with, again, the floral decorations that I mentioned to you before. And, the, uh, and again, the beautiful uh, Amsterdam script of this period, and some of it, you can see it here downstairs if your screen is big enough. Also, the cursive script that I referred to earlier. Uh, the floral decorations that are reminiscent of Spain, but the Rosenthaliana also keeps a printed version of exactly this piece. So there is a, there's a handwritten version and there's a printed version that just looks just like this. What has happened? This was made for the occasion of a wedding. The wedded couple were presented with the original copied by hand and painted and colored by hand. And the wedding guests were presented with the printed copy. So this again show, goes to show that the people who were producing the illustrations, the people who were providing the printers with the letters, the people who were um, providing them with the text, who were, who were thinking about audiences, they were one group. They were book dealers, they were book producers, they were printers, they were artists, they were the elites. It was a cooperation of the rabbinical elites and the financial elites. Manasseh's first book was financed by wealthy people from within the community. Manasseh saw to it that his first printed books looked like Sephardic books and were approved of by the local Sophia, by the local scribe. The later, later scribes re-identified with Spanish pre-expulsion Hebrew letters in order for their Hebrew letters to look as Jewish as they could be, as Sephardic as they could be, and as pre-expulsion Spanish as they could be. So for them, so this whole book production also provides us with a fascinating insight into the, the, the intellectual world, but also the politics of identity of that Amsterdam Jewish community of the 17th and early 18th century. And it was after 
I would say after 1748 that we can see a downfall, which is which is which coincides actually with an intellectual, I would say, with the Sephardic community in Amsterdam becoming less influential intellectually anyhow in the in the as of the second half of the 18th century, certainly towards the 19th century, and it changed. It certainly has to do with 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 assimilation and everything. But this, if this is what you take with you, what, 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 this is the takeaway of tonight's uh, talk, which is script, books, handwriting is always not only about content, but it is about transmission of content and definition of identity, then it was a successful contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I... Um ask a question or at least a sort of clarification on something you, you said earlier. You, you said that um, book selling was the the largest industry. I mean, uh, in terms of all in terms of turnover. Big, bigger than sort of sugar and uh, tobacco and apparently I can I can refer you to the uh, to the to the uh, to the research by Paul Dijsselbeer, who is a researcher at the University of Amsterdam, uh, who did the math. Okay. And uh, it's quite convincing, frankly. It's quite convincing. There were there were hundreds of book, uh, print shops, and there were hundreds of bookstores. So, so the, the the financial turnover of this is is much bigger. And this was everyday life. I mean, the international trade was was of the elite. This was yeah. of the of the common people. And and th these books they were mostly funded by subscription, or or, or how how did that work? Yeah. Partly by subscription is is a phenomenon of the sixteen uh, seventies and eighties. Yeah. Uh, before that, we don't see that. There were typically either uh, private funders, especially within the Sephardic community of of as I said, this cooperation between financial financial elites and and intellectual elites. So so financial the same people who would provide for the funds to have the Eshnocha built and who would provide for the funds to have the Jacaranda wood being imported for the Echal. Uh, these people would also be funding and would also be funding Hebrew books. But oftentimes printers became uh, affluent people and would also invest in books that they considered of importance. And sometimes uh, because we know that printers would print books that they found important, but sometimes people would simply come to Amsterdam with a bag of money, have their book printed, take the entire print run back to wherever they came from, and the printers printed it. It was also trained. What was the sort of censorship or, or, or control? I mean, you, you obviously you mentioned some some of the polemics were, were handwritten. In, in London, um, actually, the, I think the first Jewish book published in London, the, the author was my uh, ancestor but it was uh, published under the authority of the, the Mahamad. Did the Amsterdam community also exercise uh, control? Well, there's the, the, there's the, the, the aspect of Haskamot, um, so the, the, which is not exactly an approbation, but which is the written uh, agreement of a group of rabbis and the more approbations, the more Haskamot, the better. Uh, the written the written statement, which is often printed inside the book by famous rabbis that they uh, agree to the content of the book and or to the character of the author. And uh, so it's uh, so but that, it has not regular censorship. That's more of a of an insurance policy for the publisher. And the uh, in Amsterdam, basically, there was a there was freedom of, of you could basically print what you want, but you didn't want to get into trouble as a minority all the time. So what you thought would be would be too hot to print. You would you would still continue to publish to 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 distribute by hand, but the truth is that we don't know exactly. There was not, I don't know of many cases. I don't know of any cases, frankly, of active interference into the book production process as such in Amsterdam that can be compared, for example, to what went on in in Venice, yeah. or uh, in in the 16th century, or in. Uh, Bohemia, Moravia, uh, at the beginning of the 19th, or in in Warsaw and Russia and places like that, also in the 19th and early 20th. Nothing compared to that. And I believe Joseph Kaplan wrote about the troubles uh, Daniel Levy de Barrios had with the community to have his books printed. Can we see that as a sort of censorship? I, 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 
Yeah, maybe. Uh, let's say um, we have the books. Um, there's, there's more. I mean, uh, uh, Hamel Salomon also wrote wrote on a, a couple of examples of of of, uh, of books that have pub. I mean, yes, there was pressure, but but I use the word censorship uh, in uh, in an institutionalized way. For me, it's an institution. And there was no institutionalized censorship. There will always have been a, a wish to control the content of books that were considered problematic. And that is what went on for Daniel Levy de Barrios. But we have his writings or the majority of his writings. So it's uh, so yes, there was there was there were attempts at interference, but I would be I would and there were also successful attempts at interference, but I would be hesitant. To, uh, to 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 let's subscribe to the idea of actual censorship, which I consider institutionalized more than anything else. There were a few questions in chat. One of them was, were there any books printed in Portuguese? Yeah, not too much, but they were. Okay. Um, I found uh, that are shorter than this. Yeah. <laughs> Someone asked the first, the first, about the person that looked for is Harm den Boer. So Harm yeah. den Boer is the uh, is the researcher in uh, in in uh, now now in Basel, was from Amsterdam now in Basel, who uh, published extensively on uh, publications in printed publications in Portuguese and Spanish in Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. and in, there was a question about sermons, uh, rabbinical sermons. Were they printed ever? Yeah, uh, we, we have many that were printed. Moteras uh, were printed. Uh, a couple of others were printed. So if the great rabbis, uh, they were oftentimes printed in Spanish. And we have them in a variety of editions. Mm -hmm. uh, a question for me. You talked about cooperation between printers. Was there also competition uh, that they take each other to court? Oh yeah. To... No, go if you go into the notary notarial records that were published in Studio Rosentayane, you scan them for, uh, and even the ones that were not in the Rosentayane, you scan them for for uh, for disputes between printers. There were many. Uh, mm -hmm. The I showed you these two Yiddish translations. He was actually Uri Feivishalev and Isagat, and I think it's not Matthias. Who, who uh, simultaneously, who started out to embark upon a Yiddish translation of the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, uh, into Yiddish together. Then they entered into a dispute, and then they both did their own edition, each of 5,000 copies, and both of them were a commercial disaster. But there was an enormous fight over them. Atias, generally, he was a, a somewhat, he was a very successful printer, but also somewhat of a Lufmensch, and so he had big ideas which oftentimes looked so it's a um, uh, it was an interesting guy. Now we have a lot of uh, of course there was competition because it was a very small market. I mean, in spite of everything, uh, it's mm -hmm. not that that all Amsterdam is really interested in Jewish things. In spite of mm -hmm. everything I said before, so this is. <laughs> so, but there was of course they they were colleagues. They worked together. Uh, Manasseh and 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 Isaac about the Fonseca worked together. Isaac Abobta Fonseca was Manasseh's corrector. But later on, another, one of Manasseh's biggest frustrations in his life was the fact that he was not sent to Brazil. He wanted to go to Brazil, and Isaac Abobta Fonseca was. Uh, so so the, there were also all kinds of personal uh, disputes between them, not only commercial ones between printers, but these, were all part, these men were all part of, they were all men, they were all part of the same community. There was a lot going on. And the... Uh, we're now in the process of, of, I would almost say, of rediscovering the importance of these notarial records for everyday life. If you if you if you scan, uh, if you scan them for everyday life, uh, and now have a PhD student who's working on the negotiations, I don't see her among the audience, but the uh, on the negotiations, Julia van der Krieke, who writes a dissertation on the negotiations of the Amsterdam Sephardic Jews with the municipality of Amsterdam. On the right to settle, and the different levels of negotiation that they were entering into, and the different levels of context between all of them, 
And if you scan the everyday context, I mean, everything that makes normal life interesting, which is all the things that can typically go wrong, it's not only what goes well. Mm -hmm. uh, they are present in these in these uh, notary records. Some, uh, not not even a majority, but a major part of them has been published in Studio House and Vajana, and the large majority of them are are waiting for us to discover everyday Jewish life and everyday contact between Sephardic Jews and 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 Ashkenazic Jews on the one hand and Amsterdamers on the other hand, uh, waiting for us to discover them and to understand what was going on there. Mm -hmm. Um, at this point, I would like to thank Heide Warnke and Michelle uh, Margulie Chesner, who have been uh, providing links during your talk to the books that you mentioned. Uh, I knew I could trust uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michael, see, is the one who is the person who I mentioned who is responsible for Colombia's uh, mm -hmm. good friendly calling, the responsible for Colombia's Hebrew holding, the Jewish holding. There was a question about uh, um, Menas Ben Israel. Did he was the Hebrew book that he printed the first book he printed, or was he active before that with Spanish? Yeah, or I mean, Heide might correct me. We don't know that he was active before that really. I mean, he was he was twenty three when he published his first Hebrew book. He was born in sixteen oh four, so he was a young man. And, yeah. uh, um, so the uh, I think we know some of his activities before that, but I don't know it from the top of my head. He was certainly not otherwise involved in it. So he, of course he produced the book in twenty six, so he was even a bit younger. He was may, may have been mm -hmm. twenty two. Uh, mm -hmm. But the uh, yeah, there was it. It was a. I mean, he has also been called. I was were using the not very sophisticated word Luke mentioned. I was he was uh, uh, he was also someone who. Let's say he followed his dreams, Manasseh. It was not mm -hmm. typical for his for his life, for his sympathies with all kinds of Christian movements, the millenarians. He was he was really someone who was into basically discovering the world around him, and and the, that he would be the first one to try to start printing uh, is not a coincidence. It it it, mm -hmm. it is in, in in character with the with the man. Yeah, we. I had Stephen Nadler here as a, uh, earlier as a speaker. He wrote a biography about Menasseh Ben Israel, which I can highly recommend. Yeah. Can I um, uh, bring a, a question from um, Facebook? Um, because we were talking about different, different languages. Um, it's being asked whether any books were published in uh, Ladino, presumably sort of Judeo-Spanish, sort of export to the Ottoman Empire, and also the sort of about uh, Solitreo. Astonishingly, astonishingly few. Okay. So the uh, the main provider in the early days for Ladino were the printing presses of Salonika and and Izmir and the big Balkan centers of the 17th century. In the 18th century, that role was almost entirely taken over by the city of Livorno, Leghorn, in Italy. And they, they, they provided for the large majority of books printed in Ladino, which is basically Spanish in Hebrew script, uh, whereas Amsterdam, London, uh, Hamburg, uh, and Dordrecht, and a couple of these other places provided for the needs of uh, Latin characters. Have um, any of these Amsterdam published books turned up in, in collections in Spain and Portugal? That's to say, were they being sort of uh, snuck in? Yeah, again, that's that's one of the big big uh, accomplishments of uh, of of Harmen and Bush work that the large biographies, the bibliographies that he published, lists that he published of books by uh, Sephardic Jews. Uh, both of Amsterdam and of the Southern Netherlands and uh, of other places uh, that he found many of them back in the National Libraries of Spain and Portugal and a number of other libraries. So yes, there have been a, quite a few books that ended up in uh, hmm. libraries of Spain and Portugal. And the, But he's, all, he's basically the only one who seems to be interested in these early modern stuff. So there's a lot of work being done uh, about, about the uh, the again, about the language situation of the first year, of the, let's say the period around 1500, maybe into the 1520s. Yes. But after that, after that, there's nobody doing 
really serious work other than he uh, on on the basically listing what was going on there. So it's, uh, it's an interesting topic, but there's a lot a lot of work to be done. Anyone who wants to write the list, <laughs> feel invited. Um, Ton, uh, we, we, we've been going almost an hour and a half. Should we perhaps? <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Um, yeah. I, I, I think it's absolutely we lost, we lost a on the way. We lost a few people on the way. No problem. Oh, we had a very, very good turnout both here and on, uh, on, on, on Facebook. And thank you, of course, to everyone for coming. And, and, and thank you. It's absolutely fascinating. Okay. Thank you very yes. much. Tom, would you like to. Um, Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone, for turning up and uh, listen to this wonderful presentation. Thank you, Emil, for Great. giving it. And uh, thank you for the many insights you have given us into uh, the early modern Amsterdam book world. Um, we don't have a speaker yet for next week. Uh, so... We can't announce that yet, um, but uh, I would like to thank again our patrons for uh, supporting us and making these broadcasts uh, possible. And Emil will send you a, uh, an invitation to talk uh, later on in a few minutes. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. See you thank next you. week. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Hey, David. David, can you hear me? I can hear you. I thought I was scheduled for next week. Ah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Ton, 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 Ton forgot. I'm afraid uh, another speaker cancelled. So, uh, Alain, we look forward to uh, welcoming you next week. And actually, there's um, I, I I don't know if we're in touch with you. There's some some Fahis who um, uh, are, are doing some research. So I'll I'll, I'll have them uh, come to. I do I do apologise for that. You you know how uh, chaotic we are. So, uh, okay. I, uh, I will we'll talk you. next week. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, everyone is invited to uh, to send us questions uh, through sephaticgenealogy.com for Alan Fari. They are most welcome. Okay. And also, sorry, and something else I, I, I forgot is on Thursday, um, the Lord Mayor of London is attending a Zoom event. Uh, about the development of uh, Bevis Marks Synagogue. And uh, with Tom's permission, I shall send out an email to everyone about that on Monday morning. Yes. So um, thank you. Thank you again to Emil. Thank you for, to Alain for reminding us that we have a speaker. Uh, the week after that is, uh, I, think, I think it's Second Seder, so we won't be, uh, won't be broadcasting. But uh, good night and thank you, one and all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.